I think the minute I stepped on our practice field for rugby, the calling happened. Uh, an eight-year plan to be on the team, and I was in it within two years. Don't wait until you are a pro to be a pro, right? Like, I like doing something, look, stopping and learning from it. Like, it just looked like it was a heavy hit. If it's up, it's not up. You know, that's the first time I played, like, professionally. I'm making rugby money. How can I make money outside of it? And those two Scottish guys, and they said, oh, you're, um, you're here for the movie. Rugby is a sport where that's often coupled with actually having a good time. He looked at me and he says, you guys are awesome. Brought to you by the Rugby Outlet Mall, equipping you for freedom and connection through rugby. Find out more at RugbyOutletMall.com. Yo, what's up everybody? Welcome to another great episode of Grow Rugby. It's 2021, baby! First episode of 2021. Thank you so much for being here, giving me another year, another bit of time, some more guests, some more opportunities, the stories. Ah, I'm excited. Definitely has been a crazy start to the year. I mean, you know, I always feel like the first like two months of a new year is really just a run over from the previous year. And we're definitely getting the run over from the previous year. I mean, we know about what happened at the Capitol building and, uh, you know, everything that's going to go on here with elections and pandemic is still like hot, but you know, I don't care. Like I feel good about what we have going on for this next year. Like I feel like 2021 isn't so much that it's going to be a better year, but is that we're mentally more prepared for it. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that you guys are feeling that too. We got rugby coming back in March. And we got rugby coming back in July and with the Olympics. And we got hopefully rugby, even though they haven't really talked very much about it for the Women's Rugby World Cup, coming back in like September. So it's like, yeah, we got, we got a lot to still be grateful for. There's a lot that's going to still be happening. So... I'm looking forward to it. Uh, In the meantime, before you guys continue on, please, please, guys, go and follow this podcast. Like it on your Apple. Subscribe to it on Apple or Spotify or Google. You know, uh, definitely like the Instagram page over on uh, at Grow Rugby Podcast. Every follow, every subscribe, and definitely every review that you guys put on Apple Podcasts. Uh, is definitely helpful, adds to the credibility, and allows others to be able to find this. And if you find value in this, I promise I want it to be able to be found value for other people. So thank you if you have done it. Thank you if you do it. And uh, please, I will continue to try and earn it if you haven't done it yet. So uh, I love it. And uh, of course, check out the the full video. You can check out the full videos. And we're actually going to put down the breakdowns over on the YouTube channel at uh, at, uh, youtube.com slash gift time rugby network uh, and you guys can find the videos and then more because there's there's a lot that's going to be going down for 2021 so um, one of the things that I wanted to at least talk about and I put it here uh, I actually talked about it in a New Year's post that I placed on my IGs on Gift Time Rugby Network, on Gift Time Rugby IG, and uh, subsequently on the Grow Rugby Podcast IG, that, uh, actually on the HBCU Rugby Classic IG, is that we are bringing the HBCU Rugby Classic back May 1st and 2nd, baby, until, you know, unless something seriously happens and we have to move it. Never, not canceling it, we would have to move it. But as of right now, the HBCU Rugby Classic is back. May 1st and 2nd, 2021, you got four months, and we are going to be bringing some great talent. There is a lot of great rugby that's going to be happening in this scope, and we're doing something a little special, just in case we can't bring any audiences, because there's a high likelihood that the vaccine isn't going to be hitting everybody like that yet, but going to have a little something special for you so that you can enjoy and really set up into it, but I want you guys to put it on your calendar, all right? Get it ready. And you guys can go check HBCURugbyClassic.com uh, uh, for information. And definitely always check 
their social medias, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, HBCU Rugby Classic. Yo, we're throwing down the information there, so you guys check it out. We got a great guest, an amazing guest for you today, Tozan Tutitanwe. He's going to be uh, joining us. This is my guy. You might know him better as Viral Rugby. Uh, he is just a treasure trove of knowledge coming from economics to uh, um, to rugby technical coaching to uh, media and business. Yo, this dude does it all. The man's a renaissance man. And uh, you guys, we had an amazing conversation. Uh, we're talking about the state of media, uh, rugby and media, the state of media in the rugby industry and the development of rugby in the States. And it's just a great way to kick off the energy for 2021, really trying to go hard. And I think you guys, I don't even think, I know you guys are going to love what we have to be able to offer for this one. It was, it is just so much to be able to take from it. And I think you guys will enjoy it all the way through. Uh, Tolan is a coach as well. I mean, he's, he's does the behind the scenes. He's on the diversity and inclusion committee for USA rugby. He is one of the t- most talked with, uh, guys behind the scenes for, uh, coaches and administrators in USA rugby, as well as youth and college rugby. You guys might not even realize it. He's made dope highlight videos for everybody. Again, check out his YouTube page, viral rugby. Um, and it's just, yo, it's my guy, yo, this is my brother from another mother, Nigerian life. So, uh, guys, you will surely, surely enjoy this. Uh, we obviously come back with an amazing sponsorship from the Rugby Outlet Mall. Yo, guys, go check it out. We put in some brand new designs for shirts. Yo, we got a brand new shirt, Rugby's on, check it out. You guys are not going to want to miss this, rocking it out. Kick off 2021 right. Go. All you got to do is go to RugbyOutletMall.com. And then you guys can use the promo code GROW. G-R-E-A-U-X. Rugby. G-R-E-A-U-X. Rugby. All one word. Get 20% off of uh, shipping. And you guys will be able to enjoy uh, just being able to recognize yourselves within the community. And just being able to rock out. Just rock out, and it's going to be dope. So, uh, And, of course, you know, please, please check out the documentary Singapore to Tokyo any way we can. You guys, you know, this, this is still January. Get the remembrance of what it felt like to involve yourselves with the people, being able to be within the community of rugby, being able to play rugby, being able to enjoy the full lifestyle that rugby has to offer. And, uh, you know, you guys can go to redearthfilms.vhx.tv. That's redearthfilms.vhx.tv. Guys, check it out. Seven episodes, 20 minutes apiece. Yo, the travel between Singapore to Tokyo for the 2019 Rugby World Cup. Yo, it's real. Oh, it's absolutely real. And you'll love every moment of it. There's never a bad review that goes with it. In the meantime... While you guys are here, let me get you over to this amazing interview. Tozan Tutitanwe of Viral Rugby, of T.C. Williams High School Rugby, and Maryland Rugby player, Renaissance man, my guy. Check him out. Grow Rugby, 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 Grow Rugby. Yo, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another great episode of Grow Rugby. I got another incredibly V, incredibly I, and the P of people in my life, <laughs> my boy, f- known as, and you didn't even say formerly known as, no, forever known as Viral Rugby, coach of the apparently high school rugby football team, formerly known as TC Williams High, <laughs> my guy. Tozan, Tutsi Tanway. Yo, Tozan, man. It has been so long, and it's so good to be able to talk with you again, my brother. Right. I mean, like, I think when we first started kicking all this stuff off, like, about what, five years ago? Yes! Like, sixteen when we started um, cranking out these these different, like, video podcasts and just having discussions around content. It's been a minute. It's been a um, minute. Life kicks in. Yeah. 
Man, well, look, man, it's it's good. It's good to get it back, especially as I age this particular podcast, starting my 2021 campaign of Grow Rugby, you know, number one for the number one year of the decade, because mm-hmm. 2020 technically is not the beginning of the decade. We know. Correct. Correct. <laughs> so, you know, I, I wanted to even just start off just catching up with uh, what you've been up to. Obviously, you know, there's been a lot of stuff personally, and then obviously give just a quick background of what you were doing over in Viral, because uh, I feel like whenever some people have said some stuff about highlight videos and nobody doing women's rugby elite highlight videos, I felt some type of way about it, because I was like, yo, I got a brother right over here who got a whole YouTube channel full of them, but, you know, you see how the, the 2020 was 10 years long, so I, I get how people can forget. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, and, and you know, like... So basically, you know, since I opened the channel back in 16, um, you know, I had a um, video podcast. I did some interviews. I had a sort of a interview format show, uh, um, 1v1, um, and all those things. I haven't really picked up with them. Uh, you know, like cat, life catches up with us. Um, I've been coaching. Pre- professional life has gotten busy. Um I now have two kids. Creating uh, those next gen ruggers. Right. Yeah. So I got boy and girl now, um, Xavier and Makeda. Uh, Makeda, everybody knows, is fine, fine. Um, and Xavier's nickname is Biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> so you're really trying to get him to be a uh, front rower, aren't you? That's just. <laughs> hey, you know what I mean? hey, he, hey, when you see him, like, there's really not much question as to. Uh, he moves heavy objects now. <laughs> yeah. Oh God! <laughs> like he- carts loaded with stuff, he moves it. No, uh, right. like what is he like two, one? Nah, he's one. He turned. He just turned one. Yo. Um, December 29th. Bruh, bruh. All right, yo, you, 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 you get another big one of you. Oh Lord, look, the world ain't ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, it's wild. He wear he wears twenty four month clothing right now like <laughs> just a big kid and, and so Makeda was the picky eater right Xavier he'll eat everything except sweets he does not like sweet things at yo, all this man, yo like he'll take like we have these like um these vegetable pouches yeah he prefers the ones mixed with vegetables than the ones that are just fruit so he likes meat, he likes eggs, he likes vegetables, like he eats all of our food. He eats okra, he eats vegetable, he eats goosey, he eats moi he eats, he eats all of that. Like this boy, a true Nigerian, he's he's about the savory, not the sweet. Right, but like he eats pepper. Like so we like our we eat hot. So yeah. like he if you're sitting there eating, it is not you are going to give him some. Like there's gonna be trouble. <laughs> So that's how I found he eats pepper, he's good with it. Like Bruh. Yeah, completely different. Too spicy. No, it's spicy. No, 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 no. Nope, nope, nope. It's kind of grazes, eats like a bird, you know, like takes Ooh. a few hours to finish a plate. Which is fine, you know. Uh, that means we don't have to worry about her like overeating and things like that. Right. Then we gotta watch on the other end to make sure he's not like Eating past satiation, that type of deal, but right. But he eats healthy. Like apparently, he's he's eating really clean. If you just yeah. go on vegetables first, and then even he if the under meat side, yeah, yep, he'll, oh. like he'll eat anything you got on the plate. Like, <laughs> it's like he will eat it. He's like, he says, "I'm not gonna take touch that processed sugar." All right, I stay woke. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> oh. No, man, I, I think that's so dope. And, you know, it, it, it's definitely one of those things, especially when it comes within this rugby industry, just being able to grow and develop. And, you know, just even mentioning the fact that it's 2016, whenever we started four or five years ago, five years ago. Five years ago, yeah. Five Actually, years my, ago. Um, my, um, what was it? I guess what we call it. My inaugural video, I guess. Yeah. Um. <laughs> The Women's Day video, the one that really popped, would be five years ago in February. That's wild. That's what, and that's like it's it's our it's wild enough because it's half a decade. But I think it's even more wild because it feels like in a lot of cases, I feel like where rugby was in 2016 is so substantially different than where it is now. Yeah. Um, you know, 
even in, in, in it, when it comes to the awareness that has been going on within rugby itself, like even if this 2020, I think, brought a lot of things out from under the rug more than not that they were unaware, but it had to be brought up to the surface. Sure. I think we started to see just even in the dynamic of the technical, uh, what do you call it? I don't want to say fully the industrial aspects, but oh, I guess to some extent, the industry aspects of rugby has even taken a different twist sure. now than it was just five years ago. Most certainly, most certainly. You know, uh, you know, one of those factors I, I think really does stand out was development of the women's game. Um, you know, we we, we started. I've, I always have talked about it with multiple people, but I feel like you know around 2017 when we had the women's rugby World Cup, we we saw like an elevation. Yeah. Uh, I think we saw. Like quality, game, quality of production, exactly. Like the it was clearly more invested in. I think France did a wonderful job getting people into the stadiums. Um, it's clear that what they put together was for production, right? So, so we ended up with a wonderful content that they're still using today, right? Um, it's like one of the things that you and I have always been banging our heads about is that you cannot promote a, promote a game without content, right? quality content and those moments we had moments in that world cup um not just american moments but just overall um great moments for the women's game of, of you know feats of athleticism amazing you know tension um you know some underdog stuff um some underperformance some overperformance the stuff that we in sports culture is a part of the discourse right right and we actually had real available content that allows people to consume um, right. those things as a, as they would a sport, you know? Yeah. And, and, and it was, it, it, and it started to at least give the appearance that we were at least creating the uh, celebrityfication a little, uh, just slightly in it. Mm -hmm. I think we saw it more within like maybe Australia and, and oh, yeah. Yeah, but, Australia did, did a really strong job branding their athletes. Yeah. Um, in the sense that they are able to, you know, leverage sponsorship um, to, to get where there's products, um, things that they can leverage for themselves for compensation. Um, they definitely converted the visibility to something valuable, um, both for the athlete and for the game itself, which, you know, this idea of mutual benefit, which probably we'll, we'll probably end up talking about some manner um, yeah. during our broadcast that, um, we have to get away from the idea that it is there is the athletes are participants without mutual benefit for this type right. of thing that you know that you know not even just athletes um coaches administrators the um you know people um, people like us in the media that things it is okay to to be compensated for doing what you're doing um and and to expect that to expect right. compensation um and to be and to be compensated reasonably is what the market would demand. Um, so the idea that these athletes should also be able to create an image, brand it, and then profit from it. Um, that's going to attract more talent to the sport, more attention to the sport. Those things um, goes from strength to strength when we do those type of things. Right. Um, but if we keep approaching it like it's a recreational charity, that's not what we're going to see long term. We'll we'll grow as a participant sport, as a recreation sport, but we won't grow as a an actual uh, elite and and, right. and developing industrial sport. Right. We won't we won't, we won't break into that to that culture you know, that way. I agree. And you know what? Let's let I, I kind of want to let's go ahead and dive into this a little bit more. Um, you know, one one thing that I was really looking for that I found really helpful coming into this 2021 was during 2020 uh, when everything started to have these stoppages, uh, mm -hmm. we start to see a lot of the unions right at the brink of struggle. I felt, you know, yeah. we know USA rugby went into bankruptcy. Yeah. Uh, rugby Australia. Right. was Somebody predicted that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and all the, and all the fallout and restructuring that had to happen from that. I think we were also talking about 2017, 2016. <laughs> like, yep. Yep. But it it wasn't ever you could see you could you could see it coming down the lane, um, but you know. Uh, um, uh, additionally, we saw, like I said, uh, Rugby Australia saw themselves on the brink of going bankrupt again. Yeah. 
uh, RFU was already furloughing players, essentially, yeah. and, and trying not to pay. Uh, and we just saw it consistently, the impacts of COVID and, and the way that business has was. Even in the professional premiership and Pro 14, you started to see the weaknesses that were in the structure of, of rugby, uh, where Pro 14, while they were going, uh, you started to see them talk about not paying players and shutting things down. Premiership did shut down and were already weren't paying players until they had to you know figure out this stuff. So I, basically, all this time, we started to see this this foundational failure across the board, and I was yep. so happy about it because I was like, rugby has been needing to get that immediate reset uh, for since its inception, but definitely since at least the advent of 1995, uh, whenever they switched over to to profess, uh, to being able to be paid. So for you, uh, as you're watching this from you know watching this from from your couch during this 2020, uh, in this aspect, what were some of the things that you were starting to feel or starting to notice that you're like, okay, there might be something that we can uh, that can be done here. There's something new or coming, or maybe something revealing. Well, it's one big thing that was that was revealing is the there's there's an enormous gap. Um, for how we present content to the public. All of our content and broadcast and media is geared towards people that are that already play the game. Right. So that's something that we still haven't, it's, it's more, um, it's more um, exposed than ever and more apparent than ever that we need more we need rugby in more places you know you talk about the p's of marketing right right so where is rugby in a promotional sense what places do we see rugby and rugby content right now it's on the web occasionally on broadcast television um but right now a huge amount of the u.s content's behind a paywall right and once again, we've also talked about this. You, you you grow your market before you milk your market. Right. And we haven't we haven't sown enough market share to justify any manner of harvest, um, which is kind of tough. Um, so we're still in the investment and growth phase. But I understand people. These things cost money. Platforms cost money. Uh, equipment costs money. Getting people to venues costs money. So the question is, who are the investors that are going to be willing to willing to put that up when the risk is at the at its highest, but to put up enough to where it's at a competitive quality, right, of production, and where it creates enough valuable content that is eye catching when people can consume it where we can go beyond the idea that rugby is this outlandish entertaining hobby right that people that people engage in and people kind of have the circus the circus sideshow approach of wow i went to this party one time this rugby party after seeing this crazy game with all this blood they don't remember the score they don't remember who played well they don't remember right. all those things that we talk about when we have moments in sports when they've consumed a sport, when I've consumed a sport, um, they don't really come out in the story. So something about that is not connecting with the non-rugby populace. Right. So we have to we have to invest an, an enormous amount of time and energy into sort of breaking those chains and saying, okay, now people need to start seeing rugby in a different way. Right. I, now, as a high school coach. I've become more cognizant of what people's perception of rugby is when I'm telling them their kid should play it. Right. Um, so those sort of, oh my gosh, I knew this crazy guy, you know, I, oh my gosh, I knew this crazy woman. Uh, Tommy oh boy God. rugby. Right. Yeah. Um, where it's, it's now the social aspect has plenty of valuable things to share, but in itself, fraternities don't really market themselves that way. So right. organizations don't market themselves that way. So right. if we decide we want to do go that route and there's value in doing that, 
there's a different approach that probably we can do more effectively dollar for dollar how we're going about it. Uh, but I think that we want to get this in schools. We want to get this um, with a lot of independent clubs. We want people of all age, play, all ages playing, different codes, um, touch, contact, introducing contact in youth, et cetera. We want all of these opportunities. So how, are we posi- how have we positioned our product to be successful in that specific venture? And I feel that that has been one of the questions that, um, you know, we, we, we've talked about, um, but I, I don't know if people still fully embrace it. So, you know, whenever you talk about like the social aspect, I, I'm with you in the fact that it, it gets presented very frat. We always constantly present it very frat like, but I don't think that's a negative as much as it is whenever you're overbearing into it. Right. So whenever it's been, you know, I, I've been a big advocate that I feel like the rugby culture is far more valuable than the rugby sport, but it's how the, the culture is. We, when we want to present it in the interconnective network, the global network, which means there is, is, is the value of nepotism that can be presented through that. Because if you know rugby, then I know rugby and I know rugby, then I have, you have opportunity, you have opportunity, I provide boom. But whenever you take it within the concept of, Hey, uh, you know, we trash this, uh, we get wasted here and that's it. We, uh, uh, it, it, and, and it's not to, to say the center or take that out, but in, in totality, but it's to not lean into it. I think that we haven't been able to, as a rugby community, and, and I say as a rugby community, I say properly as an industry, has not been able to, to, to properly dissect that area, which is where most people seem to embrace the concept of rugby, which is the camaraderie and everything. Then from there, we get the game aspect and what we do on the pitch. Well, I think the other. Well, I, think that, I think that's a product. That's a problem. That's a problem right. for a product, because then we're talking about selling an experience. Right. But so, isn't that? What, but isn't that what we want in in this era? Because for, everything for, is for, more for, for a participate for participation. Absolutely. Right. For spectators, selling an experience comes from the content you're able to produce. Very true. But that's they why I say like they don't they don't care they don't care how much we like each other after we play. <laughs> like you know what I mean? Well, I mean, I would make an argument for that. Because I don't I think the content then it goes again, what are we doing off the field and versus on it? It's I think it's the same concept of like the Olympic story. Like people want to be able to connect with it because you want the the the, the on field content to climax what the story is telling you. Uh, and within the story is where you get the experiential view. But it, and it goes again that you need to be able to have that emotional content. So I think what we, we've tried, I, for me, I felt like we've actually over leveraged trying to talk about the impact of the game on the field, the toughness, the blood, the right, blah, right, blah, blah, right. blah, blah, blah. And that over goes into trying to be like where you said it's an event. We talk about moments, yeah. but we're not actually highlighting the stories. And, or, or, or anything that they connect with. It's like right. when you have the sideshow effect, you're, you're, you're looking at it at a distance and saying, oh, my God, I can't – I'm not connected to this. That's literally the feeling. Of exactly. Looking at a sideshow. Um, but kind of what you were saying um, specifically around the emotional connection. So there's another side of that emotion. Uh, we think about the, the – okay, the, emp- the empathetic – Right. Sort of, okay, warm feeling of emotion when we tie to stories. But think about how boxing is promoted. Right. And think about how rivalries are promoted. True. Where, so right, like I, re- I was raised in Cleveland, Ohio. I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. You know, the- Congratulations for you guys finally getting something. Right. In- it, it, only, it, it only took to a global pandemic. Right, you know, including our coach, including our coach, our coach going down. Right, like a few of your coaches and your right, punter. Right, right. <laughs> the but the idea that these folks have a sense of hatred for each other out of that rivalry, right? right? The idea that okay, when we are leading up to a big, I mean, we talk about the golden era of boxing, right? where the lead up was these guys are the greatest of the greats and you end up with trilogies 
because the way things work out, the way things there, the promotions leading up to it, the clashes at the way in, those type of things like where we think about emotional investment in the sense of, okay, we like it versus it provoking an emotion in us. Right. Where that connects us. That's Whether true. Whether it's um Tap that anger, re- reptilian brain. Right. Like we want, like, okay, I want to see how this plays out. Like right. tension, creating that type of deal. Um if everyone's kind of just like, you know, average in that right. sense, it's going to be very difficult to connect with anyone on that story level that you're talking about, right? True. Um, because, oh, these guys are just like me. So why would I pay to watch them? No, that's true. I, I, I've been wondering, I've, I've constantly had that internal battle of how do you, how are you able to create the 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 like you said the rivalry aspect the the one versus one aspect while simultaneously uh, trying not to step too far into the vilification but you know I, I, but at the same time I also have been against the over humility right. that comes along with exactly. it, it, it right. over, we nobody wants villains. we need right. more villains yeah. and that's that's the thing I I, right. I feel like it's it's a difference between. The team being the villain and the person being the villain. I think we always you need voices. You, you need somebody who creates dissent uh, because dissent at least creates a line. But I, I do wonder if it's it's better to try and formulate it in the factor of of my my brother is going against my brother and I'm not about to let my brother win on me versus my enemy goes against my enemy and right. I got to destroy my enemy. Well, so. Yeah. We talk about how the new writing for DC and the DC Cinematic Universe and the Marvel right. Cinematic Universe has gotten away from sort of the traditional protagonist antagonist sort of model. Right. We need but to actually really, build a villain. It's a series of conflicts, a very right. complex entanglements. That what are their with people with different perspective and stakes in what's going on, right? So with sport, we always had that. True. We always had this, like, okay, this person's retiring. This person is, this might be, they might be traded soon. Mm-hmm. This person has to perform or else the person who's behind them is going to replace them. Right. That level of investment that comes in there. Oh, by the way, one match away from the playoffs. Right. right? Or in rugby, which we have a great, uh, we have a great system of promotion relegation. They, they can be promoted. They can be relegated. All those things are built in tension wise uh, that if we just present it and present the content in a meaningfully consumable way, that's on par with whom we want to say we are competing with mm-hmm. as a, or as a, as a product, then we, we're going to get somewhere. Um, but we're right now, I think, and so we are kind of, I mean, we're in the field, so we're kind of harder on the product than we probably should be. But I mean, but, isn't that part of the advancement process? Exactly. That's, that's the product <laughs> development process, right? Yeah. That we're always improving it. Um, we're looking at where it's going to go, where does it fit, where does it, does it, where it does not fit, um, how, and keeping it relevant. And I think that relevance um, in itself is a very valuable thing in the current culture right right now. So we talk about socially relevant. We talk about um, where do you stand on various social issues? Um, um, the gentleman who came out who plays for New England. Right. Um, and kudos to him. And the outpouring support he, that he received was absolutely, it was heartwarming yeah. for me. Keep it in. That goes into that. My brother is my brother, and I keep my I keep my I keep my I am my brother's keeper in a sense. Right. In that that element that, or my you know, system. People, you want to be correct? Oh sure, sure. And you, well, you can and you can't be happy enough for someone who is able to live their truth openly Fact. and and happily, right? And then also still pursuing the sport at the highest level they possibly can in mm-hmm. the United States. That's something that's meaningful. Now, um, I've talked, I've definitely talked to some folks on in the background where I think they think that maybe New England's kind of a little too jumping into this in the sense of, okay, well, were they playing this guy before? Now, right. all of a sudden, now they're, he's, the, he's a face that they didn't want to give a shot on the pitch or right. give, give, him as much, give him as much time as he deserved. We'll see how that plays out, right? Because there's a backlash with, with um, sort of that taking that approach of marketing 
where it really screws the athlete, like we see with Michael Sam, right? Right. So Michael Sam was absolute was an absolutely he led the SEC in sacks. He was an absolutely slightly above average defensive end right. for right. Missouri. That yeah. Right. But yeah. he did lead the league. He did. But yeah. he wasn't above average. He, he he had a great system. He took advantage of it. And yeah. he was great. He, he deserved to be in the league and all that good right. stuff. Exactly. At the very least. By his own merit. Right. Exactly. On his own merit, there are – you could not tell me that every single defensive end in the league at that time was better than he was. Right. You could never explain – you could never, ever, ever, ever convince me of that um, based on just the performance of where he performed and how well he performed right. going out. Um, now maybe he didn't try, maybe he didn't show well in tryouts, this, that, and the other. Okay, fair enough. Maybe that's how that played out. But just seeing how those things end up happening, it's going to be interesting. And I hope that we are very vigilant about the individuals, um, like I said, social environment being very relevant, that we're vigilant about how, what happens going forward in their rugby life, their professional life now, right? Yes, right. this person is now an inspirational being, right? The people that they that that they are inspiring need to see them succeed in what they've set out to do. Right. That's extremely important. Right. Um, it's not just to use them as a as um as you know, a, a as top. as a tool, right? Probably. Right. You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden we hear nothing about him. We don't hear see anything about his career, and also it puts a pressure pressure on him because now he's got to perform, right? Right. It's his, and maybe it gives him the motivation that he needs to take it to the next level for himself and continue to make a name for himself. For I wish him all the best. I think that it's absolutely, absolutely wonderful scenario. It just right. comes with some complexities um, when we're talking about marketing a product that could turn out fantastic. And also, I, we've also seen it turn out not as great as far as from the for the athlete themselves. Right, right. But you know, so. Without stepping too far into the social aspect, because that's another topic I want to be able to move on a little bit later. But it kind of going back into what we're talking about in terms of setting up the platform for that, that, that again, off of that inspirational, where we set up the angels and the demons, the heroes and, and the villains within that. Uh, even within that aspect, I, I do go, I've always, been, you know, we, we, we go into the advocacy of, yeah, we need to make sure that these guys are or these these players are setting themselves are, are being set up to to assess and access that reptilian side and access that exploration side of the audience too but that's why i go like to to what extent do we push it because i think even within the aspect of trying to develop the sport into something that is much more com consumer marketable you know we also don't want to fall into the crowd of kind of repeating this, uh, maybe not necessarily reinventing the wheel, but not falling into the same habits that folly, maybe another sport, you know, where it, it does just become a parody of that other sport. Worst thing that you can do is look like a follower whenever you're trying to be a, 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 a game breaker in it. And that's why I wonder whether it is about trying to get that middle ground. The other aspect is, and I remember having seen this when it came to, the when I came, it was a couple of years ago. Uh, I think it happened one in 2016 after uh, the Red River rivalry and an emotional outburst, and then another one that happened. I think at one of the USA Rugby Sevens. I think that was in Colorado. Mm -hmm. But it was the spectator emotional connection and outburst that goes along with it. So, in the same sense that we want to be able to inspire these emotions and emotional connectivity with it, we also have to ask ourselves what we want out of the spectator themselves. So I remember whenever the person, one person did it, you know, one uh, the person that did it in 2016, yo, they came up and they were like, oh, you, it's your fault that my team lost and it was all this. And they came out in full emotional and you could see, you know, that whole passion regardless of how it was presented. Mm -hmm. The other example being a guy similarly doing at USA Rugby Sevens uh, or the, the Collegiate Sevens that uh, they were just, like, going off on the rival team and just, like, cussing them out. If we do want to be able to have these, these connections, do we taper or try and find ways to taper those, or do we allow them to kind of go through? Because I feel like those are just as much the heavy components of the game as they are 
you know, the the drawbacks that can also oh, yeah. prevent people. Oh, absolutely. I mean, fanaticism, right? That's what exactly. that, that is what fan is short for, the fanatic. So, right. So there are some negative aspects that come with that. There's some uncomfortable aspects that come with that. But at, at its core, it's a part of what drives the sport forward. Right. The game is constantly being retooled, and this happens in all sports, so that it is more engaging to fans. Mm -hmm. We see it happen with the NFL. We've seen it happen in rugby. We've seen it happen in basketball. We've seen, like, where they're constantly taking the product. This is product mm -hmm. refinement, right? And making sure that it remains relevant, it remains fresh, it remains consumable right. to as many people as possible um, for whatever reason. Um, so they make, they, they take features, they improve traits, they remove bugs, like that type of thing. You just take it like any other product that would right. be, um, be developed. Right. Um, but this has, and with like with any product, there's an experience that comes with it. What we're seeing is the experience end, the experiential end of, okay, the people that are consuming this product in person or online, if we talk about trolls and things like that, um, this is how they engage with the sport. Um, I always had a joke that you said we need to we need to do a better job of monetizing trolls, right? Um, because they are going to do what they're going to do no matter what. So leverage figuring out how to mitigate their harm, but leverage their engagement is kind of the goal, right? Right. And that's what makes your product visible to the point that people started making up um, stories that they know trolls would bite on. Uh, that's what the clickbaiting was supposed right. to be. About. Yeah, quick bait. I, um, I always called it like you know, provoking the pro provoking the left of the woke crowd with some story, of, like something happened, and they just completely made it up. Right, <laughs> and, and it gets people saying, "Oh my God, look at this! Look what this person did!" Right. Meanwhile, your core segment is not going to be swayed by their dissension or um, unhappiness with what happened, but you've just made the product more visible to your base. Right. Just based on that. Um, which is which is true and uh it 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 it, it does and, and it is indicative it's all, it's almost like whenever they say you, you you haven't made it until you have people who hate you correct you know? um and, and it, it is an interesting point so i guess it goes back again to trying to figure out where that middle ground is so it kind of connects me now onto that social aspect that i wanted to talk about mm -hmm. uh, where we were able to see particularly for us uh, especially within the, I guess I'll say the USA rugby, but I think everybody had some kind of conversation of it after the George Floyd situation was sure. where we saw racial aspects with the, uh, with the, um, uh, uh, with rugby. And again, things that we have already always known that have existed in it hadn't have been presented, but never truly in a widespread forum. So publicly been talked about and presented, um, you know, whether I think the the closest that probably was had to it was whenever South Africa decided to change up the way that they did their selection processing and actually force more uh, black people and mulatto people to be part of the rugby team versus the original setup that they've been having for 15s, particularly um, sure. obviously because they had been pushing them all basically towards sevens. So we have this discussion of the underlying issues that come in with rugby, but in that, we start to see some of the maybe the more passionate conversation that came along with it. Mm -hmm. Now, the question goes: Did we go in? A, did it become? Is it something that we created? That is it something that is come up that becomes destructive, or is it progressive and 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 healing? Because in one sense, you get the aspect that now you have that core base of fans now getting riled up, and you do have a line in the sand where now there is something to prove uh, and you see people in their positions. On the other side of it, it is, do we have some aspect that's able to allow it to grow into the sport and does it maybe set up a different level where now we have maybe a more pure sport aspect division or do they kind of combine into each other? What do you think? What, what, what's your, what it was your kind of thoughts when it came to this? Cause I know, this was a wild summer. This was a wild it was. summer. <laughs> no, it absolutely was. It was um, but as wild as it was, beyond even with pandemic and the pandemic and et cetera, it's not unprecedented. Right. Um, it was something that was boiling up that was going to happen at right. some point in time. 
Exactly. And these are things that have happened throughout, especially in American sports culture. Right. Um, because we view our athletes as a part of our overall culture, culture, not just a segment of sports culture. Right. Right. So we think about the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as the Bill Russells, Jackie Robinson, Muhammad Ali. Um, we think about um, their roles in American history. Right. Not even just as athletes, but in American history. Game breakers all the way through and which what what probably established them more as the legends than just their 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 sports records. Uh, Correct. And even like when we talk about some of the on the other side, like do they own the Ty Cobbs and these folks where they it we can't it, it's we're in this weird sort of Madonna whore complex, right? Where we pedestal athletes but we forget that they're just a sim- they're just simply a representation of the society that we're in. Right. Because that's where they pl- that's where they play. That's where they develop their sports. Um, they're those human factors um, as being a product of their environments. Um, just because you have a platform doesn't make you more refined, more educated, more knowledgeable about anything. Right. Um, as we as we all have do. learned many times over. <laughs> right. Um, and but I think that where we have breakthrough moments are these moments where there is some authentic authenticity um, around speaking on experiences um, where people were shaken by what they saw with George Floyd, not because it was an uncommon situation or wildly uncommon situation. It was that it was that visible. Right. Going back to what we talk about with content that the, the good person's initial reaction to situations like that is to look away. Right. Um, just like because it's uncomfortable. It's no different than when people shy away from uncomfortable conversations because they don't want to deal with the conflict that comes with disagreement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So it's really no different. The athletes deal with that. Except right. now they have 18 mics in front of them and 15 million followers, 7 million of them feel one way, you know, 8 million will feel the other way. Right. Um, and for a large, for what it's worth, the overwhelming majority of those followers feel like they own that person's opinion. Right. <laughs> because they've invested into a person in some way, shape, or form, in attention or money or whatever. Right. Like, or just simply liking the te- their team that they have right. before at the time. Um, that's what we're looking at. And that's not, like I said, it's not unprecedented because of the amount of money, the amount of visibility, the, um, the infrastructure around it. And then the media, um, empire that's built around sports worldwide, right. Um, where we've gotten to a, such a desire for authenticity that we can thank TMZ for this, right. um, seeing people as they really are. And sometimes we're inspired and sometimes we're woefully disappointed right um and that's just the nature of what those things are but it gives us things to talk about it gives us topics it gives us um it gives it, it gives it gives us content um i think that when we talk about like you know big money sports like the nfl um how much they invest in making the athletes available right to the media because they understand that that connection is very important. But then we saw with the Seahawks how the players kind of flipped it on their head, hit flipped that on that on, on their head and took the took the took it for themselves. Right. Which is really was a great thing to see because once again, mutual benefit, right? Right. Um, the individual has a right to benefit from their their likeness, their image, their et cetera, as they choose to leverage it, as long as it's within within ethics and within the rules they're bound by, things they signed in contracts. Right. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. Continue. Here here. So I, I was gonna. So you know, we 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 understand this from the athlete kind of standpoint, all right. And and I, I, I'm with you on there. I think the other part of this is where it comes down to the fan base, and obviously, there's only so much that you control. Like you said. There's 7 million that's going to like it, 8 million that's going to like another thing. Um, you know, do you do you feel like there is then subsequently for what 
is put out there, what is invested, whether it's the athlete, whether it's the media industry around it, do you feel like the fan base is responsible for their reaction to it and subsequently that it should impact the way the industry subsequently presents it? Because, like I said, with the George Floyd thing, I think what we ended up finding, what we ended up, not finding out, but what we ended up uh, having more and more heated discussions was the prioritization of how a player or the perception that the player has of how they're supposed to be prioritized coming more and more to light. And I do wonder if a little bit of that is, one, just the way that obviously the culture of, of rugby has historically been in terms of trying to keep things within a box for the sake of uh, uh, some level of a utopia that can be maybe more of a uh, uh, what's his call it? what's his name's run Jason's run Schindler's run whatever you know you know what I'm talking about the movie Logan Logan's, Logan's run. run yeah it can be more a little bit more of a Logan's run versus um, you know where you now have this uh, this this let's call it a dark spot of one of many whether it's concussions or racial aspects or whatever but uh, that gets ripped open and then people have to deal with it straight on. Right. Um, do you think that the establishment of the fan base then uh, becomes at responsible for what happens to the sport moving forward? Because if you have this and then now it's like, oh, you have this negative aspect, the worry of it inhibiting new attention uh, can be detrimental to the long term but also the concept of not addressing things can also be detrimental. So for you, how much do you feel like the fan base gets has to be responsible for creating their narrative and then subsequently the industry ends up uh, enhancing it? So, uh, and this is my professional, my, my in, in business process engineering, quality is defined by the customer's requirements. Okay. So that is the user who you're selling this to, the product, the main stakeholder of this product. Um, so the fan base is, they're going to define what is entertaining to them, what is attractive to them, what's going to get them to open their wallets and hand you money. Right. Um, for whether it be for uh, merchandise, tickets, subscriptions, et cetera, shopping at your sponsors, et cetera, right? So in terms of responsibility, I think that being a good fan is making your voice heard about what you want and what you don't want, but also being constructive and realistic about it. Um, so being able to sift through the sort of the trollish um, items that don't really take us anywhere, um, but meaningful discussion and meaningful disagreement um, because we have to be able to look and understand that, okay, there's some things that are going to be multiple sides and perspectives on what the value of something really is going to be. Just like when somebody um, analyzes a player um, where you have a system and how that player fits in that system, um, but their value is something a bit separate than that. Um, how they can be, how they can be leveraged, how they're, how useful they are to the team, et cetera. It's not really any different than that. Um, the the ability to have those even very passionate disagreements is a cornerstone of cornerstone of sports culture. So, fans being fans, having the barbershop talks, having the car talks, the arguments the drunk arguments at dinner, like, you know, while you're out. These are all part of elevating the visibility of the game. That's always going to get ugly. Right. That's, that, can always, that can always also get ugly. Um, and even the ugly moments create content that is consumed that may not promote the game in the way that we want to see it, mm -hmm. but the game is still visible. The key right. is the balance of content and moments, right? that we have more inspirational moments than we do um, like the NBA um, brawl at the palace. Right. Uh, more of those situations. Um, and it presents as human. 
which is really what sports are. It's a right. series of activities engaged by groups of humans for social enjoyment and, and consumption. Right. I mean, I, yeah, I, I like that. I, I guess, you know, I wonder if right now, because of where rugby is, rugby might be considered maybe too human uh, right now. And, and those sometimes can be the inhibitants because like you said, you, we, you typically you want it to be presented to human because everybody feels so elite that they are, they need to be brought. It's the DC universe problem. The, the gods that need to be recognized as humanity versus the Marvel of humanity being brought up to uh, the gods per se. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe I, I guess it's, it's, it's that aspect that I'm so we're so, I'm so used to seeing it within an NFL, an NBA, uh, NHL and MLB where everything is so, feel so far and above because it's it's so distant from you, whether financially or whether genetically or whether disciplinary, that I, I it always looks like, yo, the moment you step into professional athleticism, that you immediately need to be placed into that realm. But maybe we need to be looking at rugby more in the sense of Captain America being turned into from the scrawny dude up into uh, uh, actual Steve Right, right. The actual Captain America. Well, I've said this many times to folks in discussions. You know, no matter how good your church league ba church league basketball team is, you're not going to play against the Lakers. Right, you're just not. No, uh, you know, LeBron is not going to come down and play against your, <laughs> but against your YMCA rec league. <laughs> like. It, it doesn't even matter whether you can win or lose or you can compete. It, it, none of that comes into the equation because they're just two different lanes. Right. And we talk about product seg 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 um, seg um, segmentation. We have to define our segments. Right. So this is, that's, that's participation and recreation. This is professional. Um, they are the same game, largely. Right. But the things around them and the people that participate them make them different um, in the sense that this is going to be a product that's going to be market, marketed specifically for entertainment to generate as much money as possible, to create as many moments that support that as possible versus getting people involved and keeping them involved as participants in the sport right. um, to make sure that there are people aware of the sport. They play it. They enjoy it. They uphold the values of that sport. Um, that's what the two things that we're looking at, the two segments. And growing those segments have are two very discreetly different tasks. Right. But because we have so few people involved, where people are doing double yep, they're double people doing double duty and it's overlapping and priorities and inevitably what happens is priorities overlap. And that makes sense. And, and, and I feel like, and I noticed that going in, like, even sometimes whenever we sit, I sit back, and I, I know for me, this this next year, and which we've kind of all been working on it for the last, since we started on the, our stuff, but really specifically has been, look, this point moving forward is really making sure to establish the industry side. I don't want player participation people to be working so heavily on trying to create industry rugby industry elements because there's just not enough time to do both um outside of the aspect of being able to promote your own personal brand and whatnot like that but it like you said it, it does rotate they're almost like they have to rotate in opposition of each other um just to be able to it's what is it whenever your hand's going right and your left hand is going left and you're trying to make sure they're going simultaneously mm -hmm. it's it's trying to do that so I, I do find that the interesting component is having to be able to navigate that between our line uh, for the audience and the industry while also simultaneously trying to develop the, the player participation side, which I'll be honest, I feel like the player participation side is a lot more developed. Not that that's a crazy statement, but that, that's pretty obvious. But it, it, it's, it's, for lack of a better word, maybe easier right now yeah, to do. Absolutely. So, and it's going to run into this next question of mine, and and this one, it I, I feel like it's not going to be super controversial, but I think it's also been one that keeps bringing up repetitively, and it goes back to what we were talking about, monetization. Um, you know, now a lot of times whenever we are speaking on 
uh, elements of monetization. I've seen even now, especially after what's gone on with 2020, and a lot came after that 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 the George Floyd. But really, is is the the impact of monetization. So we you spoke of it earlier on things being behind a paywall uh, on one aspect. Um, you know, I've we've had I've heard discussions online about. Um, being able to pay for camps or, uh, you know, selections. And we've known, obviously, when it comes to putting onto teams. My my perspective on this has been, I think we have a very slippery slope here on the vilification of monetary usage in rugby and the need for it to be advanced things um, to a point where it sometimes makes it feel like everything is um, requiring, what's the word I'm looking for? That everything in rugby requires a low barrier of entry, but I would make also make the argument that we also have prevented a lot of legitimate talent on multiple levels from coming in because we've created these subsequent barriers of entry. For you, you know, and, and I know you spoke it a little bit, but where do you see that balance coming in when it comes to? Uh, one aspect for players, one aspect for fans. I know these are very different sides, but kind of speak on the player aspect first because I think that's a little bit closer to home. So with players, um, we are in an incomparable situation uh, when, we co- when we're competing with other sports because we're trying to get youth to participate in our sport. So right. that means that there are honestly – if we're being completely honest, three hours a day that they're available, right? Seven days, and it's a, on average. So let's say that five days a week, right? Um, that's fifteen hours of the day of their time that we are competing for with. Insert how many other, not just sports activities, right? Especially in this era where you now have even more available content to you. Uh, than ever before, whether from gaming to video to uh, any streaming or audio, whatever. So as we're competing for that time, um, the question is, what is the value they are getting for that time? Right. Um, And we don't have the luxury of other sports where there's a lot of there are many many free options for people to get familiar with the sport before they want to go further with it so if you if you want to play competitive rugby um, on a competitive team it's very it's very reasonable to expect that you're not going to play very much but you're going to pay all the dues and everything everybody else will right but if it's for, if it's recreation and participation, then what are you paying to get really? Right. You see what I mean? Um, high school wise, that's why I feel that um, getting the sport into high schools and the public school system is the most important thing we can do. Um, it'll get as many people playing for free as possible. Right. Or close to free as possible where it's not coming out of the parents or the um, the athlete's pocket. Right. Um, right now, people point to like, okay, people paying $2,000 to play for um, insert CYO basketball team here, right? Mm-hmm. But they have the luxury of doing that because all those kids played together and against each other for free for their high schools. And they want to continue, so they go get together, and they all live where they live, and they get together and compete against other folks from other states to do those things because mm-hmm. that free situation exists already. Um, same thing with the football camps. So the majority of the football activity happens at that high school. They get handed pads. They pay their little fee with their permission slip. Right. They turn their pads back in at the end of the season. And then some of them who want to go further and are able to do so, they can fundraise and go play seven on seven in Florida. Right. These are all things that there is a free, uh, a substantial free option that or less costly, less or less costly. Mm-hmm. Um, and even then, 
there are no barriers. Um, so in a, if it's in a public high school, it's, if they are, let's say, they're on re, free on reduced meals, um, they got a free from free bus pass, that type of thing. Families on SNAP, um, disabled parents, all these things that where uh, their activities and academics are further subsidized. These are people that are kind of left in the cold when we're talking about, okay, it's just literally a, a pay to play recreation situation. Right. Um, but in a public school, you say you can't afford it, it gets figured out. And I, I do, and that's that's one thing I, I had the same feeling because I was like, I feel like the fact that people have this issue stands more to the problem with the system that we've had here in the States of rugby versus the actual pay to play because pay to play is such a common aspect. I don't I've, very rarely do you hear somebody go, man, I, I wish that I didn't play for that AAU camp, uh, that AAU tournament, that AAU team that's playing. But I guess when you go to value proposition is, well, you know, they could either get a scholarship, they could either go pro or they, they have the network. Work, right. Right. You know, finite so, time, finite money. Exactly. Exactly. So it, 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 it even asked because I was even because I remember having this discussion and I even mentioned I was like you know what is the uh, the element when it comes to like the Nike football camps like I looked at those prices and I was like oh those are like three to four hundred dollars yeah. like but what do we get from them this is where you seen the top NFL players come out of the highest recruits this is there's a bed that comes around with that so we do have the pleasantry of an element for pay to play. Um, but I think it goes also, back. Somebody to, pays. Maybe somebody pays. Doesn't pay. Right. Somebody pays. Somebody. There's, there's money coming out. Some, right. Exactly. So it's it's like okay. So that means our base structure has to come from where our youth element, and then we goes into well, then what is the thing that we have missing? Do we are we losing players? I don't actually believe that we're in a in a lack of potential players. I, I think there's always been that. Um, but then it goes, what's the next structure up? The coaching, the refing, you know, and then where do you, how do you resolve those aspects right there? Because when it comes to football, it, and for lack of a better word, it seems, you know, at least at the youth level, you know, you can probably find some that they might not be good coaches, but they'll be capable enough to fill in an area outside of being an absolute danger to to the kids, you know, maybe some old school ways and stuff like that. But you can find somebody to fill in the place. Um, but it seems like for rugby, because of the fact that there is such uh, a low amount of available coaches who then also need to be compensated, um, you know, what you're able to, to do, then you kind of hinder your ability to spread the game that much more. Uh, for you, like, you know – do you see what? What do you see that 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 solve in that? And it might not be a simple answer, but you know, it's not, I believe in you. It's not. It's not a simple. It's not a simple answer. There is a balance there, but um, the idea that something is done for free does impact how people view it in terms of its value. Right. So when you have uncompensated coaches. That's why you have you know, revolving doors of coaches. Right. And because you have lower expectations. So yeah. there is not – you have less of an ability to hold accountability to said coaches. Right. And who's going to reconfigure their professional career when they have, you know, they have responsibilities, they have bills, they have things they have to do without being able to, to, uh, to account for that time? Now, it's okay when we have less responsibilities, we have more time. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've paid, to, I've literally paid to coach for well over, wow, 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that you can choose to do. Right. But um, you get a lot of burnout. You get a lot of uh, quality issues where things, it costs money to remain current in terms of your coaching development um, to improve and that type of deal. Um, but if we were to compare it, well, because it's a separate discussion about the potential co coaching and refereeing pipeline, mm -hmm. in every other sport, the average, and it goes right back to getting the sport in the, into school, and especially in the public schools, 
the average coach and referee in any other sport has a high school has high school experience at most. Right. Right. We don't need any more than that. Um, until the the high school level is of a of a quality that produces that, we're going to have this problem. No, that that makes sense, and that and that goes back to even uh, how we impact uh, the fan base as well uh, as well as the casual. Because um, if you're not able to have that development, it's a lot harder to be able to establish the casualness. The casual fans, and I keep emphasizing the casual fans because that's where the money really is spent, is it made is. from. Yeah. Um, so without being able to constantly showcase it, you have that. And I think that's also why I, I take a little bit of – I have not as much a high res- uh, uh, expectation for broadcasting games on a traditional linear TV aspect because right. I don't see the um, the returning benefit overall – because you don't have a back-end expression versus, at least within the streaming element, there's uh, accessibility of anywhere. Even if it's not the, I'm going to run into it, though, again, people aren't they're starting to lose their uh, likelihood of watching TV like that. Nobody really flips channels like that. Mm-hmm. So I'm about to say that um, the SEO marketing is a big part of – catching the casual fan right right so how how we're coding the descriptions the metadata and that type of thing right where we're making sure that the sport is appearing and you know people that have done the data science work and the correlation can look and say okay this person's online behavior would lead to say okay they would like the following five things and making sure that shows up you know right now I, and that's and that that that's one area that I think is is going to be where uh, the industry is going to end up having to focus in on is how do we establish the area for rugby focused media uh, media marketers um, and not just simply uh, what's the best way of putting it not just simply game developers I like you said they kind of have to work in rotation simultaneously. Well, and just to think about it, so in the position, when you talk about marketing, there are different functions of marketing, right? So, but I'll take it in terms of ideology. So marketing, taking a product, I look look at marketing as taking a product and making it more valuable. Right. To the audience or the the customer that you're selling it to. Right. Um, Some people take a more tactical approach and say... Marketing is promotion. Marketing is pricing. Marketing is, you know, insert one of the things there. But in the end, it's really optimization. Big, optimization of the value of a product or service, right? Experience or whatever you're selling, um, and making sure that the maximum value and return on that value is what we can get if that's what we're putting out there. Um, if, we, if we're not doing that, when we're marketing, so if we're taking rugby media, rugby content, and we're trying to market it, we're trying to make it as valuable to who we're selling it to as possible. Right. But what does that, what does that entail? You know, and then we, there's a list of things, goals and objectives that we would take on. That, yeah. No, I, I think that's 100% it. I think that's 100% it. I will say there's one more aspect that I think that will – be able to help affect this if it's done right. Um, you know, one thing that I have a personal interest in working on is in the aspect of what the NCAA does with the change of the NIL law. You know, being able to use likenesses now. Um, I, I've been, uh, I haven't been the biggest advocate of rugby being a part of the NCAA uh, for a while, just because I didn't never saw what the the true returning value was. Like, don't get me wrong, I know the programs exist, but I wasn't really a hundred percent. I was like. Seems like you're kind of even though you're getting resources, it seems like you're cutting the well. And the and the resources come from the school, not the NCAA. Well, yeah, but that's the thing. You don't get the resources unless you get it from the school. But then right. you get the handicap of being under the NCAA. NCAA right. Yeah, and compli- part of it. the compliance burden. Exactly. Yeah. And obviously, as we've been saying, the the application is so huge when it comes to rugby. Yeah. But now with the aspect of NIL being played into it. 
it feels like now there is, while you could have still said it was there and it hasn't been taken care of before, now there's a little bit better of a partnering between um, a player being able to hyper-brand themselves and actually being able to utilize the resources that come from the school itself. Right. right. Yeah. Well, well, it's tough, though, because we haven't done the work, the background work of making collegiate rugby a viable, consistent product for people to consume. Right. That that platform isn't quite there yet. They can, they can, they can, you can, somebody can do, you know, do the Instagram model style thing where they're an individual influencer content creator that just happens to play rugby. Right. Um, some NFL guys have done that as well. Right. But in terms of taking that product and making it valuable enough from the NCAA or college or whatever, um, governorship, gover- um, you know, gov- governance structure they're under, you have to have something that we're showing. Otherwise, it, the use yeah. of their likeness is kind of meaningless, right? We have to be able to name um, the top, the ten top collegiate fly halves before we even care about doing that. True, but I think that that's actually where it goes to the incentive. And I, I think, and, and this is one that I, I noticed with the advent of the MLR. And tell me, because as, as a high school coach, you've seen it, but I felt like we prior to even though we had the, these professional startup and failures pop in once the MLR established itself in its second year, third year, we'll call it establishment in, in this case, but we'll, we'll yeah, establish teams coming in. Apparently. Exactly. I'm hearing, so, I'm hearing stuff like a new team out of Colorado is getting started. All kinds of stuff's going on. Exactly. So we, we there's the access of the perception of a, a, an aspect that there's a place to aspire to, uh, whether it's the money, regardless of what the monetary situation is, there's something to aspire to. And I noticed that now the high school students have a much different look and aspect to how they utilize rugby to access more value, even when it comes to the collegiate side. Because even before, like, we had collegiate teams that had scholarships, not many by any means, but we had them in existence. But I didn't feel like there was that much of an effort as there has been the last two years where, like, there is a real concerted effort of making sure we have highlights, making sure – uh, there's some establishment of a name that the need for media entities to present them becomes a lot more valuable as a result. And that's why I go like, I don't know if this NIL thing can actually add that same aspect to collegiate sports where now there's an incentive that can be used more than just the school. It, it, it actually has a value of saying the name of the school can pr- connect to the rugby and that rugby can now connect to the player. The player now has a real aspect to the brand that can connect with them, and it can cycle back essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's it's. I, I I wonder if that now because of that now you have that ability to say, all right, now there's a a more legitimate value proposition that can come coming under as a minor sport because you can win in the individual game. And we, as we said, if we can have the celebritized authentically celebritized variation of the player that stands out and then are able to perform, it can return back to what it the it can return to the value and increase of the sport itself. Yeah. Well, we, we saw flashes of that with, um, with Georgia page and things right. like that, um, where it really, it came to some individual accolade for her. It didn't really do all that much for the sport in itself. It did bring a lot of attention to Lindenwood, though. It did. You know? It did. And that part of it, you know, that's one of the – that's that's probably your best case example um, when we talk about, like, how, you know, the TIL uh, – let me say it. Wait, NIL. NIL. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still thinking Lean Six Sigma stuff right now. Uh, <laughs> the, the NIL law uh, – that being lifted now, people that have a certain look, people that have certain talents, people that, right. but it may or may not be tied to their rugby. And it's right. the interesting part. So you have like, um, I knew a, a young woman who almost got in trouble with NCAA because she did makeup tutorials. Right. She was great at it. That was her, her talent. She just happened to be a track athlete. Right. But she was monetizing her channel and they she had to shut it down. 
So, right. They did the same thing with that kid from UCF who was the punter, the the black kid from about four years ago, five years ago. Oh. Yeah. And so it's like now they can do these things. They can model. They can show off their talents. Let's say they're musicians. Some are um are some sing, uh, right? Like that type of thing with musical talents. Um, those are all things that are great for them individually. And just I think as teams, if they encourage that sort of expression from their athletes, they can benefit from it. They just have to position it in a way that they are in position to benefit from it. Right. But they're associated with this team. They're part of the brand. They're along for the ride. But that comes with a risk because... Devocation? Well, I would, I would even say, like, you know, everybody has, a, has equal potential for good or bad. Right. So when you're riding, when, you, when you're backing that horse, you got to be in when it's up and in when it's down. Right. So... One thing they can do is create a code of conduct around it, this, that, and the other. And there's some governance things you can do to make sure you're managing the culture of your team where people are able to do these things so that you're not putting the club at risk or the team at risk with what you're doing. Um, right. As long as it's positive, that type of thing, you know. Like, I don't knock anybody who uses their image to hustle. Um, it's their right. Um, of course. I mean, then we have legitimate questions when we go forward, like the things that are – more sexual in nature. So like the idea of the advent of like sexual content creation through OnlyFans or FanWise, these things that have blown up, right. um, that it's very well known that college students leverage uh, leverage these platforms very heavily, both as users and creators. So now, can they really say that at a university, this young woman or this young man cannot leverage those platforms and their image? Right. They probably, they have a good case to say they probably can't if they're going right. to appreciate with the team and this, that, and the other. But they also have the have an equal thing of saying, okay, well. How does this I, impact? How does, how does it impact it? I'm, I'm not putting the, you know, the logo out anywhere or anything like that. Right. Um, these are all really interesting questions that we have to, that are going to have to be addressed at some point. No, I agree. I agree, man. Yo, toes on. Bruh, I love these conversations. I, <laughs> it's one of the few people I can have these good conversations with in, in, in this deep aspect, man, because right. industry talk is is one that I, I, I don't think happens enough in rugby because there's just not enough industry created. Right. So we've been on that that forefront. It's, it's, an immature, it's an immature industry. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But I think it's so important that we're able to talk about these things because um, that next, even, even for us, whatever it is that we do, we're going to escalate up to a certain point. Uh, and then whatever that next generation is going to bounce from that point and go from there, hopefully, and so on and so forth. So I think these are the things that allow us to open up the dis- – not just open up the discussion, but open up the door so that the thought process can come through and, and we can be able to do more. But, yo, I, I want you to let people know where they can find you and uh, talk because uh, I also forgot to let people know that you're Mr. Behind the Scenes on so many things that and it's good that they <laughs> let them be able to contact you at some point right. if they have questions. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. Um, Instagram, Viral Rugby, Twitter, Viral Rugby, Viral Rugby TV, yeah, at, um, at um, YouTube, and then um, Viral Rugby on Facebook. Yo, absolutely love it. My brother, dude, this is a pleasure. I can't wait to do this again because I'm not going to oh, yeah. wait another, like, three years for this to be going to happen, four years to do true, it again. True, true, true. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm get you out of a little bit of your over daddy mode. This is what this is my right, goal right, now for right, 2021. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to say I need to. I probably should send you a photo. <laughs> so that way they know what's been taking up all my time. Right? You know? You know? Look, look. I I, I recognize it, but I'm not gonna lie. I get jealous. All right? I'm jealous of the kids. <laughs> oh man, uh, that's hey, that's well, it's well, family is well. Yeah. Toes on, man. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being able to open up this this awesome year already, and and just giving so much. Such a great conversation. I was enjoying it like you have no idea. We could have talked for another hour, and we, I think we did a little bit afterwards. Talked for like about another 30, 45 minutes after the fact. So, um, you know, it's it's just 
can do it again. Like we're we're gonna be trying to bring a little bit more different, a little bit more value, um, and just be able to make sure that we can help you guys as rugby people be able to as a rugby community be able to generate more from the community than just to play. If if you want to just play, cool. But we want to give you the option to be able to say, hey, all you want to do is just play, or you want to be able to get the most out of it. Um, Thank you guys for everything. Definitely check out our treasure trove of content. Uh, we've had so many, so many amazing guests come through. Uh, we've had Nia Tapper coming through on it. We've had Tiffany Faye with USA Rugby. We had uh, the, uh, the, the USA Rugby Club Council for Training and Development on the last episode. We had Curitiba Rugby out of Brazil coming in because we go international, baby. Uh, Tiara Mack from Rhode Island, the newly uh, inaugurated state senator for Rhode Island, representing rugby and on warsery of Black Girls Ruck. Coma Gandy Fishbin, board of directors, USA Rugby board of directors member, Coma Gandy Fishbin. Uh, Gordon Hanlon, coaching coordinator. Kamani Davis of um, Roots and uh, Made. Uh, we've got uh, Nicholas Walcott, Cheddar Emba, Ram Eddings, Charity Williams of Canada Rugby, Siphoning Fear of Morehouse Rugby, uh, Kyle and Tiana Granby, Phil Thiel. Like, we've got such a great level. So many amazing guests. So many people that have been able to tell their story and show the opportunity. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Check them out. Enjoy. Love it. Thank you guys for everything. And like, I always want to make sure that it's known. I hope you're happy. I hope you're healthy. And I hope you know that you are highly favored. Until next time. Cheers.